Okay, I am Claire Solorio. I am Suzanne's sister, and I'm sitting in her living room. I've been thinking about all kinds of things. Like, Suzanne was very much a part of my growing up. I, literally as a mother figure, uh, because there were times that my mother was not really present. And so her, Suzanne and Marlise, took in, took some role of, of caring for me, uh, because I'm 12 years younger than Suzanne. Uh, and thinking about how Suzanne has influenced me, uh, when I was a teenager, she by that time was in her 20s and she was there coaching me on what it means to be a woman and the different things that happen with women and as young girls are growing up and she was the one that took me and I bought a brassiere and she's the one that taught me about what it means when this monthly thing happens and so she was very much uh, my guide in that. Um, and she also, you know, I've been thinking about the character. So one thing that is really concrete for me and has always been such a very firm memory is when we were younger, and I don't remember exactly how old I was, but we were walking from the mall and it, there was an underground area, so it was Mayfield Mall. We were walking through that underground parking, and there was a $10 bill. And so I saw the $10 bill, and I'm like, yeah, grab it, take it, run with it. And Suzanne said, no, we have to take it to the mall office. We have to see if anyone has lost it. And then if anyone doesn't claim it, then you can get it. And that had a huge impact on me and what is fair and what is right so um, those are some things. Uh, I also have thought about her final days, and there's mixed emotion there. Um, when she was in the hospital, we had some very sweet, tender moments. Um, even though she was not, she was saying things that didn't make sense, there was still some beauty there. Um, when she transitioned to the skilled nursing facility, I started doing some of the care, uh, you know, like she needed to be repositioned. So, you know, there's some of that care piece where I'd be holding her and pulling her up. Um, but there's also some mixed thoughts that I have because she pushed me away. She, in her final hours, she was, I was reading to her and she would hold up her hand like, you know, maybe I, my reading was bothering her or um, maybe I'd get too maudlin. She didn't, I don't think she really liked that, but I don't know. So I don't know what was going on in her head. So those are things that are going through my mind is, well, w w did I have a positive impact in those final hours? And I think sometimes she said she felt more like an aunt because of the distance in age. But definitely, my big sister, I admired, wanted to be like Susanna Marlise, tagged along, was annoying. I, th I would say some of my first memories are of her and Marlise being in their room, brushing their hair. Um, I remember they had this room. It was one of the largest bedrooms. And so they had their twin beds and they had Nancy Drew Mysteries. And I very much remember the Nancy Drew Mysteries. Um, I remember them taking me to Woolworths. And that was a very big deal because they took me over to Woolworths and we got to have a lemon Coke. It was amazing. And I felt like I was being included because it was usually just the two of them. And... Um, so they were peers, but you were sort of the junior to that? Junior, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say that shifted once I got older, once I became a human being. Well, that's what Michael would call me, is once I got older, I became human. But <laughs> um, And we had something, and not that they were ever unkind to me. They've always been very kind. Um, and Suzanne 
when I was when I was younger, I had a real interest in ballet and theater. And Suzanne, when, now that I look back on it, I can think she was 24 years old. And so she wasn't earning that much. She had graduated with this degree in anthropology. She was working at Emporium as basically an administrative assistant. She was managing the delivery for the Emporium furniture. And um, so she wasn't earning very much, but she would arrange and take me to the ballet or to the theater and we'd go out for dinner and I didn't realize what that must have cost her as a young person just starting out. So we yeah, have very kind um, but as I got older then I became never on equal level because I was always the young, little baby sister. Um, even in her final days you know there were things where it would come up and I would make a suggestion and I became very concerned with her. Um, well, of course, through this whole final thing of cancer, but I would say in August, there were things that were warning signs to me. And I kept trying to get her to have someone come in. And she would say, I'm not ready yet, I'm not ready. And I knew you know, if it came from someone else, but as the younger sister, it wasn't gonna be as accepted. She uh, was fine living here alone. She had always lived alone. She would tell me, I think she wanted to have a companion. She loved um, this man, and I think she would have married him, but she always questioned, would I be able to live with someone else? Because I, she would say of herself, I like doing things the way I like doing things. I don't want to change. I have my ways. And she knew that. Like, I would come in and do something different, and I would say, okay, Suzanne, don't look. I'm about to put extra grounds of coffee into the filter. Just don't look. And, and she knew that. She knew she was very particular. And that was a big worry for her. Um, in, this, in this final time, she knew there was going to be a point where things were going to go downhill. And she really did not want to have people she didn't know in her house. She didn't want to have strangers that she had to be nice to, is what she said. So she, and yet, she was a super personable person. She would be able to talk to anyone about anything. Uh, people, when they got to know her, would really, they loved her. She made an impression. She visited with my husband's family um, she was in Southern California at the time, and she couldn't get back up north to our to um, my parents. And so we said, "Why don't you join us?" And I don't think we were married at the time. So she, but she came, uh, and we went to Imperial and went to my husband's parents. And although he wasn't my husband at the time, and and they they really enjoyed her, and she loved them and it, there was such a connection that happened that my father-in-law kept asking about my sister how is your sister doing how's and my sister-in-law she when she heard about Suzanne and different things she's like oh gosh my heart is so heavy and there and she told me there was there was something very unique about Suzanne and I use that as an illustration that she just comes in to some place where there's strangers and she had an impact on people. I, I think that, okay, so I have a couple of thoughts. One is she was very warm, but as you have heard, um, Suzanne also had a spiky side and she was very firm. And, and if she didn't like the way something was done at work, I mean, she would tell them. I've I heard her uh, very gently coaching people when she was on call, but I also heard some very firm. Listen, this is what you need to do. So um, she was very personable, but at the same time, to present an accurate picture, she also had a a way about her that if it wasn't going right, you were going to know and you would be corrected. Um, I think with her 
she loved people. She enjoyed that interaction with people. But if I, in my uh, Myers-Briggs type indicator hat, if I were to say, okay, how would I describe her? I would say she probably re-energizes through being alone. And it probably her preference is uh, that at the end of her day, she wanted to have her own space. She didn't want to have to please anyone. She didn't want to have to listen to anyone. She wanted to do things her way, and she wanted to be on her own. And that, for her, was a very comfortable place. To, to understand where that germ of interest came from, I think it came from her childhood that, and from my parents, because both my parents uh, studied French at Stanford. My father was a French teacher. He ended up uh, living, and they all lived in France for a couple of years. And then coming back into the United States, she was still very young, so she may not, she has some memories, but she was influenced by that and that interest area. Um, and then as far as our, our parents, they were very European-centric. So we always heard about the different ways that things were done, and that was incorporated. And uh, they would use snippets of French. They didn't speak French regularly, but there was enough that there was a sense of there's a world outside of Palo Alto. Uh, and so that was intriguing. Um, then she just had a natural interest in different people, different areas, uh, and I think that led to anthropology. Uh, and she uh, went, she was able to travel with my father. So that was part of what he, she, that again piqued her interest. Uh, and when she graduated from college, after all of the hoopla of her initial cancer, the Hodgkin's and the melanoma, uh, she was able to go on a long Europe trip. And she did that on her own. And she went to all different spots within Europe. I would say her preference in terms of travel was in the UK um, and France. I was shocked to learn recently that she had never gone to Rome. And I had thought, for sure she had gone to Rome because she has a strong interest in archaeology. She had a strong interest in church history, and yet she had never gone into Italy. So, you know, there were some places she didn't go. Uh, that is, if, if she were here and she were to say, okay, this is the, my last day, the thing that she would say that she's most disappointed by is she, she didn't get one last trip. It's all she wanted. So going through the heart surgery, the goal was one last trip. She, she had a great appreciation for the, the English culture. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and because our heritage is likely from Wales, uh, we know that that's where our direct descendants came from. Uh, when they came to the United States, they were coming from Wales. So that UK piece, uh, now in, in the UK, Wales is not considered to be as posh as other areas. So maybe Suzanne would say she would own that Welsh piece of her, but she would also want to be the Britain piece. Um, but it's not just, not just the UK. I, I think her interests also were in France, and um, she went to... Switzerland, we had a good family friend who lived there because of my mother's connection. Um, in fact, my sister Marlise was named after her. And so anything that, I would say maybe northern France, northern areas, that would be where her interests lie. It wouldn't be biological, but my father's stepfather was Yugoslavian. I think my main memory is just any time someone was going to take a picture, we had food in our mouth. So all the pictures, you know, someone's got food in their mouth. Um, definitely some, there was traditional food. So we had the turkey for Christmas. But I think what comes to mind very clearly to me right now is the barbecue that my grandfather did um, in the summer. 
He had a big rotisserie and he would barbecue all of these ribs and he would not share what his barbecue recipe was, kept that secret. Um, and, and it had a very unique flavor that wasn't, it's not typical when you go to other barbecue restaurants, you're not going to find that. So I know that was a big, um, it was a food that Suzanne really liked, and she would look for barbecue restaurants that would have that. And so there was one in this area that she said, let's try this restaurant. I think it tastes as close to grandpa's ribs as possible. Um, but I, I, I will also say, just because she was very ethnic oriented, so my father went through a Chinese cooking phase, and we all loved that. Uh, and Suzanne was interested in cooking all different types of ethnicities, and she brought that to the family, because when she went to UC Berkeley, she stayed in a community house that was international. There were lots of different nationalities there were represented, and that influenced her, that then had a ripple effect on her family. She was a very good cook. Yes, I would. I know that she did some baking, but I think primarily what I remember are the things that she would cook. Like she had, uh, she would cook some d b dishes that were from my mom, my mom's recipes, like a lemon chicken. Um, but she also cooked a lot of more eth what I call ethnic. So they were Middle Eastern. She loved Indian food, so she cooked Indian food. But when you bring up precision. She was a good cook, and things tasted great, but she also was very precise. She would cook, and then she would pack them up into little containers so they would go in her freezer and just so right, you know, so they were ready to go for lunches, and she was very precise in that piece. Oh, in the garden, yeah, yeah. yes. She really loved gardening and took a lot of pride in her garden. I think that was an area that was frustrating when she was not healthy to be able to care for the garden. And she'd look out and she'd just like, oh, you know, not being able to see things the way that she wanted. So when she moved in here, there wasn't a whole lot in her garden. And so she put in the pond, uh, she put in the arbor, she uh, dug up and, and tilled in good soil. Um, there was some volunteers in terms of uh, floral, flora that she didn't want. So, you know, I, I remember being with her in the backyard and we're pulling out things that uh, wasn't what she wanted in there. So she had very clear ideas of what she wanted to do with the garden and she took it to a place that she wanted and she, she achieved that. Um, and then every year was a little different in terms of what she planted. So some years there was potatoes that she would do in a bag. And then uh, some years there was going to be tomatoes. Um, she was, the bane of her existence was those squirrels that would eat the produce. So, every, yep. And this year, not so much. <laughs> it, was, it was an English garden in that it wasn't controlled. It, it wasn't a garden where, where you have a patch that is a square. There were flowers that would be coming up and they would be at different levels and different colors. And there was ground cover in certain areas and then moving into um, different levels. So she was very intentional about getting the variety of colors and levels and um, having it in appearance be pretty, but not controlled. Suzanne loved birds. Oh yeah, that was very important to her. And the suet feeders out front, the seed feeders in the back, um, the hummingbird feeders, uh, that one of them was taken down. She had two hummingbird feeders. And, and she loved being able to sit at her breakfast table and eat and watch the birds come in. And we spent a lot of time, because when I would come to visit, that's where we would sh sit down and chat, and we would just watch the birds. Uh, that, for me, is going to be one of the saddest things about selling the house, because for me, that is a very firm memory of my daughter, who also is very much like Suzanne, loves birds, loves um, gardening, 
and and unfortunately her mother does not as much so it's not a good mentor in that but Suzanne was and they sat I don't know how many hours they were sitting there at the back window talking about the different birds talking about the garden I mean what a great memory yes she is and she's she's smart and she um, yeah she's and in fact she is thinking of studying environmental science but I see in her some of the tendencies toward computer programming and my son is studying software engineering and so I wonder I like in the back of my mind I wonder are you going to go down the pathway of science or are you going to go down that pathway like your aunt Suzanne because um, Suzanne that when I asked her this was probably about two, three months before she passed away. I asked her, and, and I only because I wasn't asking her, like, well, what would you do differently in your life? But I was asking for myself, thinking, what, what do I want? At the end of my days, is there anything that I would go back, I would change? And so I, I asked her, as far as career, is there anything you would have done differently? Is there any career that you would have said, you know, if I could go back, another pathway I would try? And she said the only thing that she regretted was that she didn't discover that she had such an interest in computers until it, she was in her, like, it, I believe it was her late 20s that she made that transition. So... I wonder about my, that, so looping it back to my daughter, yeah, I wonder. Because my father, he um, transitioned from being a French teacher to working for computers for the school district, Palo Alto School District, and did their programming, which is a whole nother story, with these huge mainframe, you know, big room, yeah, it was, it was just a whole different world. Um, and then went back to school and did a vocational training for computer programming, and then ended up working for Rome, which eventually became IBM. And so he did that transition uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. And so he was the one that was, our, he was established and then taught Suzanne. And that's how that, that there was a ripple effect in that, and it may have influenced her in what she ended up going into. I, yeah, I, and, and it's a good point because she, as a woman, going to college in the 1970s, certainly far more options than what my mother would have been coached and what she could do. But she may not have had the same um, prevalence of options of, we'll consider computers, even though my father was working with computers might also have been a little bit of, I don't want to do what my dad does, shifting away from that. Um, and of, in terms of her interests, very interested in anthropology and linguistics. So she was following a passion. It just wasn't a very lucrative passion. <laughs> so she went to UC Santa Barbara, hated UC Santa Barbara, like really hated it. So then she, when she came back, that summer, then she made the decision to go to UC Berkeley. Loved UC Berkeley. Could not have been a better fit for her. So that's where and she got the degree. Um, was not, went through the whole cancer thing, went and traveled. Uh, and I think she did some work. And then decided that she was going to go to the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. I think it's a different name now, but that's what what it was and that's where Marlise went so that's why she wanted to uh, do that but her focus was going to be more in the business end of fashion whereas Marlise was more on the artistic design end of fashion uh, and she did that and I think she did work in marketing for a very short period of time did not like it uh, it like and just knowing Suzanne I would 
I'm a career coach, I would say probably is not a good fit for her and her personality. Uh, and she discovered that. So that's when she started working at Emporium because she needed to have money coming in. And it was furniture delivery. It was very administrative. She was very good at it, but she didn't like it. It didn't challenge her. You've got someone who has a brilliant mind and she's doing things that's just, there's no challenge. So that's when she um, went toward computers and I don't know who her first job was with, but I know she worked with Mervyn's. Um, so I'm not sure on the timing of, if, if it she went right to Mervyn's after getting some exposure through with my dad. But that was the one I know she was with Mervyn's for quite a while. Uh, she worked in Hayward, and then they ended up moving all of their functionality down to Southern California. So to keep her job, she moved to Southern California um, and really didn't like Southern California. Nice thing about Southern California, she was closer to me closer to Marlise, because by that time, I was living in San Diego, Marlise was in LA. And so uh, we were able to get together and have sister gatherings and eat El Pollo Loco and have a good time together. So that was the positive. The negative is the Southern California culture, not a good fit for Suzanne. So she endured for a while. And then I want to say it was around 1990, it might have been 1990, that she moved. She, um, because she got a job at Wells Fargo, and uh, in, 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 in her process, she shifted toward uh, security and um, security analyst, security engineer. And so then when she got into the financial industry, who is, that's the industry that was still using the COBOL programming. And COBOL was going out, and that's what her training was in. So she had to go to a place that used mainframes. So she worked at Wells Fargo for a number of years and then transitioned to Schwab. And that's where she retired from, it's Charles Schwab. She had Hodgkin's and then melanoma and very aggressive treatment. Mm -hmm. but, there, but she had to go in for regular checks and there were side effects. Uh, because they did the, the radical surgery on her leg, she had a large portion of her calf missing that affect her, her lymph system. So she dealt with, early, at a very early age, um, edema. She had to wear special stockings. Um, she had a large skin graft. So that affected her, I think, her perception of herself because she had lots of scarring. She had scarring in lots of different places. Um, but she was cancer free for a while. Uh, she would have to go in for regular checks, Stanford every year. Then, you know, it, it, it was still every year, but they kept saying prognosis better and better and better. Um, but then she got breast cancer and they, I think they eventually came to the conclusion that the breast cancer was probably due to the type of radiation that she had. That it was so aggressive, but it saved her life. So it saved her life, but then she had to deal with the breast cancer. So that the she had a bout of breast cancer, dealt with that. Um, then she had another one, and then uh, they said, well, let's be more aggressive with this, and she had a mastectomy. Uh, and then she, after having, after, having a mastectomy, she was diagnosed again. And um, that was, I think, a very hard time for her. She is, or was, uh, incredibly strong. I don't think I know anyone who has so much, I use the word grit, because that's a popular word right now, just to be able to endure. And there are some things that are not being shared that were really difficult and she endured and the cancer and the cancer again and the cancer again um, and then she was diagnosed with and I want to say it was ovarian cancer 
but I'm not I'm not 100% on that. Um, and it, that's just my mind won't pull in the facts. So she was diagnosed again. And, and every time it was, okay, here we go again. And she was always worried about making sure she had all the facts before she would tell me anything. She wanted to make sure she knew, all right, here's what I know, here's the prognosis, this is what the treatment is going to be. She was caring about me when she was going to have to go through another bout of hell. I would say the latter cancers, the, the breast cancer, breast cancer series, the ovarian cancer, that was less of a near-death experience. I don't. I think it was caught early because they Stanford was keeping such a close eye on her. Um, I think that the uh, final breast cancer after the mastectomy. I think that was a little jarring. But when she had Hodgkin's, uh, yeah, that was very very serious. I don't remember a lot from that time period, and I don't know. I remember her being in her room. I remember her being very sick. I remember the smell of sickness. Um, I remember being turned off by certain smells, and it's hard for me to go into medical facilities for that reason, but I don't have distinct memories of her besides seeing her hair. She lost like a, um, like a moon shape on the back of her head. She lost her hair. So she had the top portion. She had a crown, but not the rest of her hair, and I remember that, um, as far as her personality, I think it did impact her, of course, but it wasn't like she became hugely bitter. There wasn't anything that I noticed, but I might have been too young to pick up on it. She would, um, if you're looking at the trend, she would, she would be here, energy, then she would get sick, then she would rebound, but she won't go as high. Then she would get sick again, she would rebound. And so each time it took something from her. I think that she had, I think that she had more of a crisis of faith when she kept having cancer. And life became harder and harder. And her life became more closed in because her energy, because in her rebound, she was getting older, and her body was being bombarded with whatever treatment they were giving her, um, that her life became smaller, meaning that she would go to work, and at times her work was wonderful, but there were times when she had bosses that were not that great, were frustrating, uh, and so she stopped going to some of her evening activities, stopped participating in the choir. Um, even toward the end, uh, she stopped going to the Doctor Who group, the um, Legions of Rassilon that she would go to, just because she said, I don't have the energy. I don't have it. And I think that's really one major reason why she stopped the folk dancing. It's not that she didn't still enjoy it. It's that she just didn't have the energy for it. When she was diagnosed, this was back in October. Um, I know she went into the hospital. I, it was October 22nd uh, because my mother went into the hospital on the same day. And she went into the hospital. They started doing tests, and then she contacted me and said, well, they've diagnosed it as, um, as cancer. They found cancer, and they're going to find more details. But... Uh, it is the lung, it's a lung cancer. It was small cell non-smoker lung cancer. So and on top of everything else, she never smoked and she gets lung cancer. I mean, it's just everything just doesn't seem fair. Um, but in that, so that was that initial diagnosis. And then um, she went through the year going through different treatments. Um, in these final days, every doctor that would talk to me would say, I cannot believe what she has gone through. I cannot believe every single doctor would comment to the fact of, oh my gosh, how much she has survived. In her final day, um, 
uh, maybe 36 hours, uh, one of someone from hospice came and they said, she's a fighter. She, because they had, they had said to Michael, said, uh, well, you know, she's really coming down to the end. I talked to them on the phone. They said, well, I think we're looking at the next day, maybe three days. So I get in there at that point, she has not been eating. She's not been doing anything. And I'm thinking, okay, that's it. No, she is still, she's still fighting for her life. She's still fighting. And, and, and that, is, that grit, that fight, is why she was able to go through so much. This is what I find a little ironic, is that Suzanne was voicing to me, I'm ready to go. And she says, not that I want to kill myself, but because she was very clear um, in the meeting that we had with the palli palliative care team with Kaiser. She was very clear, not that I would want to do anything drastic, but she would voice to me even before her brain was addled with the cancer. She said, I, I'm, I'm okay. I want to do one big trip and then I'm okay with this. So it's interesting that I think for her, um, there was a piece to her that she was tired of life. There wasn't a whole lot that was that interesting. I think she was doing some, she was thinking she had longer so she was thinking about her retirement and what she could do and what she could enjoy. Um, but why would she fight? And that, so I understand the fight up to that point, but why would she fight so hard at the end? I don't know. Maybe it was habit. There was a habit that was, I, she had a habit of fighting. Um, she was tenacious from when she was young. She was a colicky baby. So there, there was a, an intensity to her in her personality, even when she was very young. So maybe that's why. The, the, the different parts that are part of dying, that was something I was encouraged with, with hospice, as they, they shared. It's not just co the conscious. It, there's all kinds of things that are going on, the soul, everything. And... You know, I do wonder if Suzanne needed time to, in, in her own mind, kind of rectify this frustration she had with God. Why would you allow me to have so much cancer? Why would you allow these bad things to happen? Um, she was one who, I, I mean, it, she was involved in church, very involved in church and loved being part of the choir, and she, there was a very important part to her that when she went through this crisis of faith, I think that there was still a part of her that called out and said, I, I want to rectify this. I want to, in some way, get to a place where I am, I feel at peace. And so I, I do wonder, is that what was going on? Even though she wasn't able to process, she wasn't able to speak. I don't know what was going on in her mind. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Suzanne, she was a talker. Lots and lots of talking. And she was very, she was, she was so intellectual. And she had such an eclectic taste, a, p a palette of different things that she could talk to. Um, it was really heartbreaking for me when she couldn't get words. And I was sitting right where you're sitting. And we were talking here in her living room. And she kept misusing the word, knew she wanted to say Middle Eastern. And she kept saying Mediterranean. And I knew there was something not right. And then when she was in the hospital, she would catch on, she would get on this word like context, and she kept using the word context, 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 or obligation, obligation. It would be out of order. It wouldn't make any sense, but 
Susan really helped me because she emailed and she, she would email things that Suzanne would say and she'd say, there's something poetic about this. There's something poetic about taking the words and taking them out of context. But it was hard because I couldn't know what did she need from me? What did she want to say? What, especially when in the, the final couple of days, I'm sure Michael experienced the same thing, is you want to do something to make sure her final hours are the best possible. How can we make this? And I, I was pretty aggressive with the hospice and saying, uh, if she's in any any semblance of any pain, I don't want her to be in pain. And so they were able to start low dosages of morphine, but I think that helped. Marlise, um, she had a medical history, and she was very overweight, and she was not taking care of herself. There were things that we knew Um she struggled with depression, and she was also brilliant in a different way, but brilliant, and she was funny as all get out, clever, creative, and when she died, what was hard for me is knowing because she passed away from deep vein thrombosis, she threw a clot and likely it was a saddle that went over the lungs and she died immediately. She basically stood up, died in her living room and Suzanne ended up finding her, but we don't know how many days she was there. We knew that she was sick. I had sent her emails, not gotten response. Um, so Marlise's death affected Suzanne I, I think tremendously because Mar Suzanne was coming from a place of being tired because she was going and working f 50, 60 hours a week and then every other week to go and take care of the things for my mother. Uh, it wasn't that she was caring for my mother, but she was going up and it was taking away time and she was becoming more and more depleted. And I would go and fly up as much as I could, but I, I think she was getting more and more tired. And then when Suzanne, I mean, when Marlise passed away, not only did she have her, what well, I would say her closest sister, um, her, her friend, and I, I think that, that that loss that morning, but I don't even know that she was able to deal with that because then there was the logistics of Marlise died in, in a state. So she had to deal with, okay, what do we do now? And every step took so long. Suzanne knew she was dying and just in her nature, she has planned everything out. Even so, ask Michael about whack-a-mole. I mean, right now, it's like crazy. You do one thing, and then another thing pops up, and it takes so much. Well, it was so much worse with Marlise, because she had no idea. So we're dealing with a shocking death. There's guilt. How long did she lay there? Um, we're dealing with, with Marlise. Um, she was not super well organized, so dealing with her house, I think it was so overwhelming for Suzanne. Um, Kathy, her friend Kathy, came in and helped us tremendously, and Kathy has her own backstory, and it, so it is amazing that she came and, and helped us with that. But eventually, we got through everything, and... <laughs> then October, Suzanne is diagnosed, and Suzanne's comment, once she finds out, oh, there's, there's chemo that she can take, and she's like, I don't care, as long as I can get through taxes for Marlise. That's what she cared about, not what can I do. Let me get through taxes. That's Suzanne. So 
hyper-responsible. I wasn't really part of the Tea Party crowd. So that wasn't because I was too young. And then I didn't live in the area because I went to school in Southern California. So even if I, they would have included me, most definitely. I mean, you know their personalities. They would have included me. But I wasn't around. So I don't really have a lot to say, except I loved the fact that Suzanne had these friends who continued to be friends from young and then deepened the friendship in college and then just continued it. Um, I also, I don't know if anyone has shared, they had their final tea party at the skilled nursing facility that uh, Suzanne, Susan uh, brought, I think it was Susan, brought dim sum. Because one of the things they would go and do is do dim sum. So she brought dim sum. And so there they are in the nursing facility, all, all of them. Uh, Rowan flew from Portland, and they're ch- chatting and talking, and there's Suzanne in the middle of it. And it was it was a little overwhelming for Suzanne because by that time, her brain just couldn't process. But I thought, how beautiful these people all went out of their way to come and have one last tea party, even though it wasn't a tea party, but a gathering. Um, so I thought that was that was beautiful. And they really went out of their way to come and sit with Suzanne. And that I am very grateful for. Suzanne was able to make, not necessarily a lot of friends, but she was able to make very deep connections. I think it's very telling that she felt with her coworker, she felt comfortable enough when she brought up, yes, I'm gonna be going through this heart surgery. And this coworker, Randy, came and took care of her and was there for her. Uh, She had very deep friendship from her Doctor Who crowd with Kathy and that relationship. And and Kathy, because of Suzanne, then she got connected with Marlies and with me because then I started going to Doctor Who conventions. And so that's something that I can really I can really talk about is more the Doctor Who piece uh, because that's where we did a lot of our connecting as well. Sure. Opera, she used to go to the opera, classical music, loved to listen to classical music, uh, reading, she loved different types of mysteries. Uh, she liked different types of literature in terms of a science like she, um, she subscribed to music magazine. She was, that's not science, uh, but she's uh, subscribed to Scientific America. Love any any documentary that had a link to science uh, and had a little humor. She would like, and and like she liked Top Gear, which is really about cars, but it's funny. So she really she enjoyed that. Um, she enjoyed MythBusters because of the science piece. So she did like a lot of different things. Uh, She appreciated beauty in architecture, in furniture, uh, in art, in gardens, of course. So um, I'm trying to think if there was any other area. Well, you know, knit, prolific knitter. She's got multiple drawers of sweaters and most of those she knit. Prolific knitter. She sewed, and I know, I know, you've already heard about the couch, the curtains, uh, but I mean, she said, I want a, I want a new nightgown. So here she is, she doesn't know how much longer she's going to live, but she sews herself up, you know, like it's nothing, a new nightgown. It's very, very talented in a lot of different areas. Uh, she was not a one note person. And she really didn't want to bring someone in. I, 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 this will be too much detail and that you'll cut it. But, but just with the whole, the, the whole PG&E guy coming. Okay, so if she came in and she smelled some gas, she would go, hmm, what is it? She would be pulling out the stove. She would be looking at it. She would be trying to figure out what's going on. She would not call someone in until she had exhausted her knowledge base and her ability. All right, so I think she was exposed to Doctor Who because KQED or, or the um, 
the station that South started showing old Doctor Who's when she was um, younger-ish. And so she got into the classic Doctor Who. And then from that, that interest, it, it there were other people who were interested. And so she would talk about the great storylines and how silly it is and the, the sets wobbling and, and the Dalek with the plunger. And there's there was tongue-in-cheek humor that she really liked, but there were also stories that were written that had some depth to it. And that's what she enjoyed. Uh, she really preferred, I think, as, as much as she enjoyed the new Who, I think she preferred the classic because it wasn't quite as intense. Uh, and so uh, I know she went to some science fiction conventions, but she started going regularly to Gallifrey in Southern California and was a I mean, yearly attender, regular attender, all the way up until about three years ago. I actually, I, th I think it wasn't just health. I think it was the, the convention got large and they started doing a lot lottery type of ticketing. Um, you had to click on the button or you didn't get in. They sold out very quickly. And I think she just got to a place where it was, it was too much for her or not of interest to pursue. Uh, so that's a good, it's actually segues quite beautifully because my kids got to know their Aunt Suzanne through the Doctor Who conventions. Uh, my son took an interest in the new Who, and I, th I thought that would be a great way for him to get to know Aunt Suzanne in a way that would that, that would mean something to him. He would have an interest. She would she it was a common interest. Um, up to that point, of course she was interested in Caleb and Becca, but it was more of, oh, what gifts can I give? Uh, what are they doing? There was less interaction. We'd come and visit, but it would be minimal interaction because we weren't able to visit that much. Um, but being able to connect, you have three days where you're going and going to meals and talking and talking about the different panelists and what are they sharing and what does that mean and and I I know it made a big impact on Caleb to be able to have that and he has a very firm understanding of who Aunt Suzanne is because of that I'm so grateful that my daughter was able to go to the Doctor Who conventions with Suzanne as well she was only able to do two but she was able to make that connection on the topic of Doctor Who and her friends rather than my son's friends not so much into Doctor Who but my daughter's friends are into Doctor Who so that it's like oh yeah and my aunt is into Doctor Who too so there's that connection uh, and then in addition with Becca it's like I said it was beautiful to see Suzanne connect with her on that interest in gardening and advising and guiding and and being an aunt truly an aunt that's saying well here's what you want to think about as you're thinking about school and Suzanne very much loves to pass on advice she's an advice giver so I saw that piece come into play I think she saw that there's a family resemblance in Becca. Uh, I think that she also saw the interest area and saw some of the personality of being able to be sociable, but there's also a private piece and wanting to be private. Uh, how Becca is not like Suzanne is Suzanne is very confident, knows what she wants to do, and will tell people how to do things. Whereas my daughter, not so much. She's her own person. Suzanne was fiercely loyal to family, and family was very important to her, and not just immediate family. She was fiercely loyal to uh, Aunt, our Aunt Charlotte, and that that relationship is very important with the cousins, Gabrielle, 
Kevin, Keith, uh, Mary Dawn, Laura Lee, Molly Ann, uh, Aunt Mary and Uncle Jimmy, they were both bird watchers, so she loved that. Uh, our grandparents, she, she, family was just very important to her and the interactions, and I, I don't know that that has necessarily come across, uh, so I would, I would share that. When you, I know Michael probably went around, and when you look at the art that is around, the art is primarily my great uncle Maury and my grandfather. That's very important to her. Uh, when you look at her furniture, her furniture, it's not just, oh, I liked this and I got it, or I liked it and I inherited it. It was so important to her to keep this furniture that was part of the memory of my grandparents, that she would have that. And there's this eclectic mix of the different grandparents in the family here. I, I had shared with Michael that the, the sale of Marlisa's house didn't impact me. It was like that was, uh, that was separated from Marlise, from me, for whatever reason, even though she lived there for about the same amount of time. I just didn't have the impact. Something about this house, it's, it's permeated with Suzanne, so it will be a grieving. And when you say, you know, do you have any memories? I have so many memories. There's so many times that we were here, we were talking, we were watching, we were laughing. Um, I, I, my father, and that I, I mean, it was here that I knew my father was sick, and that he was going to be dying. He didn't tell me that. He that was it was a while before that we would know that, but I knew. So there's sad memories. There's happy memories. Uh, there are memories that aren't even associated with the house, but with the furniture or something that she has used. Like Suzanne taught me about putting peanut butter in ramen noodles, and then you had a little hot sauce, and you've got like basically Thai ramen noodles. They're great. So there are little things like I'll see things that I remember from her initially teaching me this uh, that trigger that memory. And it is a memory that is coupled with her being a older sister guide, but also a friend. And, and just some of the, just laughing, laughing at different things. When she got the house, she was really excited to be able to find a home that was a craftsman home. It was very important to her that it had not been overly renovated because she wanted things the way they were. And so I, she wanted a home that she, and she knew when she got this, she said, it's, it's too big for me. Uh, and I don't know what I'm gonna do when I get older. It's not really a home that I would retire in, but I wanna live in an area. So it wasn't just the home, it was that she was walking distance to Merritt Lake. She was walking distance to restaurants. She could walk to the grocery store if she wanted to. She could, she even walked to Kaiser. So it, it was, for her, it was a community where she felt safe. And it was in a home that was in a style, because I think there was a little bit of an old soul with Suzanne. And so the style fit her. Uh, so you've got this, juxtapose this personality of this old soul uh, who really liked things in a very classic manner. I don't really know people who use handkerchiefs. And Suzanne uses handkerchiefs or used handkerchiefs. So you've got this old soul coupled with this person who loved technology. You got that? And so in this home, this you see that. You see her office with the computer and the nice monitor, et cetera. And you see, you know, the nice the nice uh, television. You have the latest in terms of her DVD play where will play DVDs from any part of the world. But it's in, you know, it's on an old, older piece of furniture. 
next to a couch that was my grandmother Bebs. So Suzanne, Suzanne is, is so loyal to her friends. She's so loyal to her family. She's someone who has very high, or had very high expectations for herself. And she believed the best in those that she had around her, that she saw, she was able to see um, those positive characteristics. She was able to see beyond maybe the exterior into what was there as far as the heart. Um, and I think she, she was able to value people's individual strengths. And even if they were annoying, she would say, you know, this is really annoying, but I see where the positive piece of this is. So, um, and I will, I, I, I struggle with, I will miss Suzanne because there's, there's no one like her. There's just, she's unique. <laughs>